Hi again, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Alumni Chats, a weekly podcast featuring alumni from the Department of Broadcasting and Journalism here at Western Illinois University. My name is Buzz Hoon. I'm the interim dean for the college, and I'm also the host of the podcast. Today, I'm talking with Tania Watson, class of 2001. Is that possible? It can't be 20 years. Yeah, I know, right? I know. It does. It <laughs> seems like just yesterday. Yep. Seems like just yesterday. <laughs> well, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit. Won't you give everybody a life update where you are and what's going on? Okay. So I currently, I'm originally from Bellwood, Illinois, um, but I reside now for the last seven, maybe eight years in Los Angeles, California. Um, so right now, the position I hold, I'm the executive producer for uh, the talk show, The Real. And we are a show that come on Fox. It's a nationally syndicated talk show. Um, and yeah, we come on five days a week. And it's pretty much a talk show that is geared towards, you know, women. We have some men that are our fans and viewers, but it's a talk show. And we pretty much cover, you know, pop culture. We cover celebrity interviews, lifestyle segments. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about anything. Um, and it's really just a forum for um, women to come together, discuss these, con- these have these conversations. Um, some of the conversations are lighter. Some of them are a little heavier, but we have just a broad range of conversations. Um, the Real is the only daytime talk show that features a panel of all women of color. Uh, so we're really proud about that. But I am the executive, pro- ex- executive producer of that show. So my job pretty much consists of the overall look of the show, um, the producers, whatever creative content that they come up with. I basically approve that and make sure it's ready for on air. Um, as far as just the, the everyday dealings you know, with the show, so um, we basically try to make sure that we're that voice of, uh, you know, of women. We're that voice of women. We, like I said, we cover heavier topics, but some are, are lighter. It still should have a vibe like you're sitting at home chatting with your girlfriends, having fun. And yeah, we, we've been doing it now. We just kicked off our eighth season. Uh, we actually premiere on the 20th of September, um, and we're really excited about it. And yeah. we're going to talk about how you got to this position. And, and I am so grateful to have you on the podcast for so many reasons. But, um, you know, I know it's a big time commitment from uh, what you have to do uh, to, to be at that level. And just to let everybody know, I asked you and, and you made time on a Saturday, which I'm so glad that we could uh, <laughs> find a time to connect. Yeah, no worries, no worries. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about um, you growing up, and you said you're from Bellwood. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's talk about some of the things that growing up that might have influenced you, that impacted you, um, and, and shaped you into the person you are. What what kind of things were uh, big influencers? Um, so I will say this. I will say growing up, I can remember always being the type of child who I love stories. I love stories. Um, I love hearing stories, telling stories, you name it. I love stories. I love putting them together. I've always been that person. Even as a child, I can remember, um, you know, my friends, you know, in the neighborhood, we would put on like these mini like talent shows. And it was, it's hilarious when I think back at it, because one of my friends got a keyboard for Christmas. And, you know, like the keyboard has like a button where you can push and it'll just play a song for you. So we would literally push that button and and he would act like he's playing and we would come up with songs and we would we would be totally into it. Like this is an entire orchestra. Right. And we would put on um, the show. We would have like someone's porch that we would invite people in the neighborhood to. We would charge them like a dollar. You know, we'd make lemonade and we'd put on this show of songs that we made up with this music that is technically not ours, but we would put on this entire show. So I've always been um, that child who just loves to perform, loves to uh, tell a story. Um, I would say growing up, I actually wanted to major in law. I wanted to be a lawyer. Okay, so I wanted to go into the law field and you know, originally going into college, that was the plan. So I was one of those students, and I always tell students this as well, to don't worry if you are undecided when you come into college, because 
that was me. I switched major, majors about three times. I wanted to be a dentist. I thought I wanted to be a psychiatrist. I wanted to be a lawyer. Then I dabbled in criminal justice for like a, a week <laughs> before I realized that, <laughs> before I realized that that's not me. Um, so, you know, it's okay if you're undecided, you know, when you first get there, you'll figure it out. You'll see what your niche is and then you just, you know, hone into that and it'll be okay. Um, but I would say that, you know, growing up, I just, I knew I loved to talk. I used to always get um, the in for uh, needs to improve on my report card and talking. Okay? <laughs> so, you know, hey, it's, it's, it, was, it was meant to be. It was in the stars for me to be in something where I'm communicating. So, um, you know, but yeah, I think that that was one of the things looking back at, you know, where I am now, it all makes sense on, you know, just, you know, wanting to perform and wanting to talk to people. I've always been very curious of people's stories as well. Like, you know, I was always that child that was always, why? Like, why? Why did you do that? Or how did you do that? I was just very, very curious. So it makes sense on the, the field that I'm in. So did that drive your, somebody in your family crazy that you were always asking that question? Absolutely. Absolutely. It was always, Tania, go take a nap. It's nap time now. <laughs> <laughs> so I took a lot of naps, a lot of yeah. naps. <laughs> well, I, you know, when I talk to people about the, the field of broadcasting or journalism, and, and I say that, you know, for somebody, you know, that's 15, 16 years old to say, what are you going to do for the rest of your life? That's a big question. Yes. Um, yeah. Whereas I'm sure if you could go back in time and say to your younger self, um, you know, everything's going to be fine. I'm going to turn out just to, you know, everything will work out well. I mean, could you imagine that you're in the position you are now back as a, in where you were in high school? You know what? Honestly, no, because back then, TV broadcasting wasn't even on my radar. It really wasn't. Um, the funny story, you know, I actually got into broadcasting on a dare. Um, so the student ran newscast, WIR, yeah. I was an anchor on the newscast. And I remember on channel three, uh, the school ran like, Hey, we're having auditions for, you know, WIR, we're looking for anchors. And I remember being in my dorm with some of my friends and they said, well, Tania, you like to talk. We're always debating different things. And you like to, you know, you're always in the newspaper and reading and what's going on. We dare you to, to try out. So I was like, all right, fine, whatever, I'll try out, sure, whatever. It was a dare. I ended up trying out for the anchor position and got it. And once I got it, I was like, okay, I guess I actually have to do it. I have it now, so let me just do it. <laughs> so once I got into it, I was like, oh, broadcasting. I love this. I love seeing the control room. I love being on set. I was like, okay, what does this camera do? And what does this button do? And that's when my curiosity just sparked. And I was like, I think I could do this. So it was totally broadcasting wasn't even on my radar at all. Wow. At all. We, we lucked into you. That ah, is hey, I lucked into you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so when you came to WIU, as you said, you came in as other as a different major, right? Mm -hmm. and, and and so um, what kind of early memories do you have uh you know, exploring the major that you were in, but also, you know, do you remember what residence hall you were in and, and I how you, in, which I think is torn down now, Wetzel. Yeah. Wetzel I, was down. Yeah. 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 Was, and then after I stayed in Wetzel my first year at WIU and then I moved to Corbin. Okay. Yeah. I moved yeah. to Corbin. Yep. <laughs> That's right. So what other kind of things did you get involved with before you got involved with broadcasting? What kind of activities did you do? Uh, let's see. Um, you know what? As far as activities, um, I was involved in BSU. I was involved in BSU, the student council, because, um, again, I, I loved being the ones that being a part of the group that had a say so in the environment. You know, like and with those groups, you know, those are groups that are, you know, pitching different things to bring certain activities and certain speakers to the uh, to the campus to just inform students of different things. And that was always something that interests me. You know, I wanted to really make our college experience like we your experience is what you make it. You yeah. know, so if you think that someone is doing something in the community or someone can help you out along the way uh, in a certain area of, of your career. Let's get that person on, on campus to speak 
you know, to talk to them. So I was always just curious and things like that. And that's why those two organizations, you know, I was attracted to them because they were, you know, developing the culture of WIU. You know, they were helping influence it and influence the students, our minds, anybody that can come on and, and get us to think, you know, get us to think and just see a different um, perspective. You know, I was always interested in that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the the group of people you hung around with. What kind of friends? Let's talk about your friends, because I'm sure that the, these people are still your friends 20 years later. Yeah. Yeah. My best friend, one of my best, best friend is uh, a graduate of WIU. We met at college. Yeah. Um, So my friends, uh, my friends, you know what? I would say this. I hung around. um, I had a a large just arrangement of friends. I really Mm -hmm. did. I mean, some were really into sports. uh, Some were, you know, the ones that were the partiers, of course. Um, But, you know, I will say this, that my friends, I always tried to surround myself with people that were on a mission. You know, um, I was never really that type of person that just like, oh, let me just, you know, go crazy and I eat this party town. Here's the thing. I know in college, you're going to have fun. You're going to party. That's part of the experience of learning who you are. I get it. But I really tried to surround myself with people who had a mission, a clear mission on what they wanted to do. Um, I had a clear mission going into college that, you know, and I think that's one of the reasons why I switched majors so much as well, because I knew I wanted to be one of those people that whatever I majored in, I wanted to work in it. And I tried my best to streamline, you know, every decision that I made to that. I wanted to work in the field that I've worked so hard to get an education and a degree in. I wanted to work in that field. And I surrounded myself with people that had that same mission and could push you. So I also think that's important as well, your circle, uh, making sure that you guys are on the same you know, level on the same, you know, thinking the same as far as like, I'm going to push you, you're going to push me. That's so important uh, during your college years. Absolutely. It really is. So what do you remember about some of the broadcasting classes that you were taking? Because I'm, I'm sure, hopefully, we were helping to prepare you as a storyteller. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, honestly, I think WRU has one of the best broadcasting programs out there. And I'm not just saying that because I'm an alumni. I feel that the classes and the classes and just the access we had to a lot of just information like you, it really, really prepared you. And being in the program, it not only prepared, because honestly, my first, uh, the goal was to be on air. Okay. And I did, I was on air for the first year out of college. So I was a freelance reporter for WGN and I did that. And after a year of doing that, I decided that you know what, I think I want to go into producing because again, I love to, I love to tell stories, but I also love to create. Mm -hmm. And obviously with the news, you can't create a story. The story is what the story is. So I wanted to have more creative control. And that's why I said, okay, I need to go into producing so I can create it. So WIU, one of the benefits of the department is, like I said, it's so much information And it's so many different layers to it. You can get hands-on experience just working with WWIR. And, you know, a lot of the information that I learned in the program, I was able to transfer that and and take it into the real world. And there were times when I was working with people who had maybe worked with the station for at least a year. They didn't know how to do certain things. And I'd be like, okay, well, I did this when I was in WWIR. So we're like, okay, I'll show you how to do it. Let me show you how this is done. You know, you're having trouble editing? Sure, let's do it, you know? So I think just, you know, allowing to, allowing the students to have access to things that they are, things and situations that they're going to run into in the real world. That's probably the biggest takeaway that I use and still use to this day. Yeah, two things that just make me think about when you're talking about that. First of all, WWIR, I never, <laughs> never hear that anymore because we ended up going to a different uh, oh, um, wow, okay. news three, but that's uh, but that's OK. I just love to hear the WWIR. But also it reminds me of how important I felt it was always important for our students to um, be well-rounded and, and have the ability to, to not only be on the air, but also to produce and to write and to edit, you know, to have uh, all the tools in their tool bag if they needed to go to them. 
Right, right. And you know what? And speaking of like all the tools, having all the tools, that is so important because I think that a lot of people in the industry, when you think broadcasting, you think on air, on air. It's yeah. so many different jobs. It's so many different departments and 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 things you can do within. Like it's huge. But when you first think about it, it's like on air. I'm going to be famous. It's so many different other like layers that you can go into. So. I would say learn, like learn all the bits and pieces and, and see what, you know, what grabs a hold of you, you know, and that's your niche. That's your niche. So when you got, as you said, when you left WIU, you, your first job was mm-hmm. a freelance reporter and yep. you must have thought, OK, now I'm on my way. Right. As you as you yeah. kind of said, um, was it uh, was it as glamorous as somebody might think it, it was or was it a lot of <laughs> tell us what it's really like <laughs> there wasn't a drop of glamour in it <laughs> <laughs> no and I, I would say that that was a misconception like I, I I honestly thought that um once I graduated I thought I would immediately be on like one of the top three markets on air on the mm. the the morning news and, you know, all of this. And, you know, it was a a very fast reality check. Once I got there, Um, I started off at WGN as an intern, actually, and I did my internship my senior year. So um, I started as an intern. The internship lasts for three months. And on my last day of my internship, they offered me a position. And that started two days after I graduated. So I literally, I was lucky enough to graduate and move right into my first job, which wow. very rare. I get it. Mm-hmm. So blessings to that. Um, but yeah, I was able to start two days after I graduated and I started out as a freelance reporter slash PA as well. Um, and so, you know, they had me just, you know, ripping scripts to the different anchors. They would send me out on like the little small stories and things like that. But, you know, I will say that since broadcasting you know, has the, a lot of people have the idea of the the glamour, you know, I'm going to be on television. I'm going to be in my dressing room and makeup is going to come in and do me and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's not that in the beginning. So you do have to pay your dues, but that's the time that you're asking those questions that you're learning. Um, even in the anchors, when the anchors would come in the, in the morning after they would get off the newscast, there was an anchor who actually just passed away, Allison Payne. Oh, yeah. Um, who was a huge mentor of mine in the in the beginning of my career. And I remember I just used to just watch her. Um, she was just so amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's almost like when she would walk into the newsroom, it was almost like she wasn't walking, like she was just gliding, you know? Mm-hmm. And so after she would get done with the newscast, I would literally, I would be off. I would, my, my, I would clock out and I would spend about an hour in her office just saying, hey, can I pick your brain? Even if you're busy, doing the story. You don't even have to talk to me. Let me just be in here. I'll be a fly on the wall. I won't say anything. I just want to watch you and hear what you do. And so she was nice enough to be like, sure, you're not, you're not bothering coming here to sit. And I, and I was able to ask questions and and learn different things, even if it's just an hour after my shift ended. So that also really helped me as well. And asking questions, that's the thing. That's the thing. Wow. What a blessing she was. And, and I'm sure not only did you see the professional side of her in that manner, but also how she treated people, because yes. I heard lots of stories of her uh, doing the same kind of thing with other people. And, and, and yeah. that is probably something that you were absorbing as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So what happened after you left the news? What, how did, and you, did you get into producing? So after I left the news, I got a position with Judge Mathis at the PA. Um, I got a position. I did that for maybe about a season or two um, as a PA. And then one of the producers ended up uh, getting pregnant and, you know, leaving or whatever. And was like, hey, I can't do this just with the, you know, the commitment of hours. Like, I can't do it now that I'm having a family. So she ended up leaving. And while I was a PA at Judge Mathis, part of our responsibility, obviously, is is to, to support the producer. So when you're booking these cases, you know, you have a certain amount of cases that you need to book for the following week. So my team, I was booking so many cases until we would be booked for our shows and we would have leftover cases to pass to other teams in case they weren't booked. So I was booking so many cases until my EP was like, hey, do you want to take a stab at producing your own cases, even though I was a PA? So I started, I still had the PA title, 
but I was producing my own cases. And so when that position opened up, she was like, okay, I'm going to literally take you from a PA to a producer. And so that's why I got my title. And then I just kept working and, 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 you know, producing my own uh, cases after judge Mathis, I went on to work at Jerry Springer, which was very interesting <laughs> to say the least. And so again, you know, even though it's wild and crazy, you know, um, it's still telling stories. It's still telling stories. So now I'm moving out of the, the courtroom circuit into the actual talk show circuit, uh, allowing people to tell stories, no matter how wild and crazy the stories are. Um, then I did a few like reality shows, still telling stories again, um, to land into the, the daytime talk world. So let's talk a little bit about being a producer before we get to being an executive producer, because I think uh, for some young people that might go into that field, um, what kind of skills do you need to have to be you know, a producer for a show? Like what, what you were doing, what kind of skills did you say, I think I, this, this would work well and, and this wouldn't work well? I think the first skill is you have to be able to listen. You have to be able to listen to um, when people are telling you their stories, it's almost like you're producing in your head. Mm -hmm. So when you're telling me a story, I'm already seeing how the segment is playing out just by hearing you speak. But in order to have that layout of the segment, you have to be able to zone in and listen to what the person is saying. Um, you have to be able to visualize what you're trying to get across. What is the message that we're trying to get across from this segment? Um, then once you figure out your message and you've listened, you have all the details, now you're really breaking it down on how does the segment play out, you know? And I tell people it's it's little things like even if you're doing a cooking segment, it's I tell my producers, it's little stuff like, okay, you got the recipe, we know what we're making, but okay, who has the utensils? So when we're gonna taste it on, on air, it's little things like that, just realizing the steps and how it's gonna play out. Um, I would also say that um, as far as another trait that you'll need is just being able to, being able to, it's almost like you have to just foresee different things that are coming up, you know, because as a producer, you are responsible from that for that, the look of everything from top to bottom. So you really have to always kind of think two steps ahead of everything so you can make sure that what you're trying to accomplish in that segment gets done. So it really just comes with listening. It comes with really just um being able to lay it out in the steps that you want, you know, you know, beat it out in different bullet points on how I want this to flow. And once you get the, the, the foundation of what you're trying to do, then just take it step by step and go and just make sure you go from the top to the bottom until everything is tied up with a bow. Is this something that you can be learned or is it, it just an innate sort of uh, ability that somebody comes in with I think, I think it's something that can be learned because I think that after, and the, here's the thing, your first time out the gate producing, you're going to make mistakes. Mm. You know, that's, that's a, a for sure thing. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to have those days where it's like, oh my God, I knew it. Or how did I miss it? You're going to have those days. That's going to happen a lot. And that's okay. Those are all things that you need to learn. But the key is to, again, listen to those mistakes because once you make a mistake, that should trigger your brain to say, that's never going to happen again. Got it. Mental note made. So you're learning from that. And that's all in that under that umbrella of listening to what is happening around you. You shouldn't, if you're making the same mistakes over and over, then you're not listening. You're not listening to the segment. You're not listening to what's going on. You're not listening to the mistakes. You're not learning anything. So I think, you know, with our industry, as we know, it's ever evolving. So I think that this is always a learning process. And you're always figuring something out every every month or so, every year or so. It's always something to figure out, you know. But the key thing is really just to listen. And it can be learned. It can. You can learn it. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of the, the joys of being a producer, though. Because, uh, you know, certainly it sounds like it, it's very complicated and, and can be, uh, you know, a, a tough job. But what what are you really proud of along the way that you said, I was so glad I got to help tell that person's story or anything that kind of stick out? Um, I, well, I would say my favorite, <laughs> probably my favorite um, segment we 
we did was the one season we were invited to the White House to interview Michelle Obama. Mm. And so that was probably like the highlight of my career, just being in the White House. Like I had to get over just walking in the doors, first of all, and, you know, meeting, you know, our former first lady, that was just the icing on the cake. I'm like, you can't even like, just let me go in the front door. That's all I need. (laughs) So just seeing her and being able to interact with her and just see her as not the first lady, but just Michelle and some, some, you know, parts of the interview. Um, After the interview, of course, she's the first lady in the interview, you know, but once the cameras were off, you know, this was that morning we did the interview. Once the cameras was off, she was like, you know what? You guys want to come back for d- dinner later? And so I'm like, wait, a- absolutely. I will wait on the lawn until dinner time if you want me to. But she just was like, yeah, you know, we'll just kind of hang out. She was like, you know what? I-, I don't really have girlfriends that come over. And so she allowed like all of the, the hosts, myself, um, our co-EP to just come and hang out we had dinner and it was just hanging out having dinner with michelle obama the oh. dogs look the dogs were running around i'm like what's 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 your dog name Bo and the other dog they were just running around i'm like okay this is weird but great did you so, think you were dreaming yeah yeah <laughs> I said, okay, i'm dreaming okay i'm still like did that really happen um, but yeah, it was, it was, a, it was oh a highlight of my career. It really, really was. Yeah. It was I think amazing. I would just retire after that and say, well, you can't do anything else after this. Uh, or, or is there somebody else that you would say, okay, this would be only the only thing that could top this is what? Um, geez, let's see. You know what? Ironically, being that, you know, I'm from Chicago, I've never met Oprah. Mm. I've never met Oprah. Um, and so I, it's always been a dream of mine to just meet her, to, you know, just have a chat with her and just kind of pick her brain. Um, but yeah, I've never met her. I've been in the same room with her before, but um, I've never met her. So I would love to just kind of pick her brain and just, you know, hear more about her personal journey, you know, in the industry. So how did you get to the real and, and become an executive producer? So the real, like I said, we're in our eighth season. Um, I started with the real. Uh, our test run was in 2013. Uh, I started out as a lifestyle producer. So I'm producing cooking segments, fashion shows, anything that's dealing with bettering your life. So started out as that. Um, did that for maybe a season or two, moved up to a senior producer um, and then to a supervising producer. And then uh, after soup, I was co-EP and then EP. Um, but with the real though, I would say I got a phone call one time from a friend of mine who lives out in LA with me. And I was actually working on a pilot um, here in LA. And she gave me a call and she says, hey, there's a new talk show that they are shooting a pilot for. It's a, it's a summer test run for three months. We didn't even, I think we only aired in like maybe 20 or 30 markets. And she says, hey, they're looking for producers. Do you want to jump on it and, you know, see what happens out? And we don't know if it's going to get picked up, but let's see what's up. So in L.A., you're always kind of looking, you know, I think in television, period, you're always looking for your next job. So it's like, hey, sure, some starting up, sign me up, whatever. So I didn't think too much of it. Um, Signed up for it, started and, you know, just fell in love with the show and realized that, you know, our show, the voice of our show is needed. It's needed in a time like this. Um, we have a lot of viewers that will watch our show to really get their information. Like they may not even watch the news, you know? So we have an obligation to have a, ri- a wide range of topics because we are giving you your information for the day. So yeah, I just fell in love with the show and, and, and been with the show ever since. Yeah. Wow. That's a... And, and I, as you said, I, I just makes me think of, you know, for years, I've taught the mass media and minorities class here mm-hmm. at WIU. And, and, you know, one of the things we always talked about was the, the need to have that type of representation yes. on, uh, on uh, and available for people. And of course, now it's not exactly on television in terms of there are so many other ways that people can access information through streaming uh, mm-hmm. and so many different services. Um, do you see that in terms of network, um, 
mm-hmm. and everything else. It, I imagine that it, being in the industry, you're seeing a lot of different changes. Are people sort of making shows more for streaming services than it used to be for network television? Yeah, I do. I do think we're moving in that direction. Um, I do. But I still think that television um, is here to stay. It's here to stay. I think that we're just going to develop, like you said, other ways of getting our information. And one of those ways now is everyone streaming. But I think that some things, even though there'll be other ways to get this information, because, hey, back in the day, we had nothing but radio. That's you know, right. so it's like, look where we are now. Now we got Hulu, we got Netflix, we got everything now. So I think television is will still be one of those staples that's not going to go anywhere. It'll just be one of the avenues that people get their information along with the other ones that are coming, you know, because some people TV is their thing. That's what they, I don't want to, I don't want to read the newspaper. I don't want to see anything else. I'm turning on my TV to find out all my information. So I think it'll be here to stay. It'll just be you know, one of the, one of the avenues that's added to the plate. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk a bit about some recommendations that you might have for a young person that is uh, considering uh, a job in the industry and maybe saying, I would love to get into, for instance, uh, be a producer for, uh, you know, a, a television show of some sort. What kind of recommendations would you have for a person in terms of developing their skills at the collegiate level? I would say what would be really, really helpful is to find a mentor, find a mentor um, who you can, who is going to tell it to you straight, you know, um, someone who is going to be invested in your being successful in this industry um, and lasting in this industry. Because I tell people all the time, this industry, it's not a It's not as glamorous as people think. You look at, oh, Hollywood and lights, camera, action. That's not that's not the reality of it. So I think this is an industry that you really do have to have a passion for in order to maintain and survive in this industry. It has to be a passion. This is not one of those industries that you're just like, okay, I think I'll go into broadcasting today. That's not what this is. So your passion, number one, is always going to drive you. All right. If this is what you have set out to do and you know it, that's going to that's going to drive you. Find a mentor that's going to be invested in your success. Someone who you can talk to and say, hey, I'm just confused. I don't know. Like, I want I want to land here. I just don't know how to get there. That person needs to be invested in helping you get to that point that you're trying to reach. Um, again, ask questions. I know earlier in my career, when I found myself in these newsrooms or, you know, uh, producing rooms for the first time, I will say if I'm if I'm completely honest, out the gate, I was a little insecure with it. Like I I would be in these rooms and I would feel like, okay, I just graduated college last month. And I would feel like, oh my God, these people are smarter. They're more experienced. Like, oh, like, why am I in this room? You start thinking like that because you're no longer in the, in the, I call it the safety nest of Macomb. You're no longer in the safety nest. You're out in the world now, you know? So, you know, when you find yourself feeling like that, I think that that's, you know, and I think that that's something that a lot of people deal with early on in their career, but you can't let that, you know, that you can't let that get you, you know, your, your, um, you, your ideas and your suggestions are just as important and needed in the room. And I try to tell my staff that I don't care if you're a scene, you're a supervising producer or a PA. I just want the great idea. If it comes from the intern, it comes from the intern. Let's just get a great idea so we can put it on air. Who cares where it comes from? Give me the great idea. You know, (laughs) so I run my staff like that. I have everyone in this in these meetings. Let's just land on the solution. Who cares where it comes from? So definitely, I would say a mentor. I would definitely say, and that mentor will help you with your confidence in that room because these rooms can be intimidating. Broadcasting can be intimidating. Um, I would also advise them to an internship is very important because, and I guess this kind of goes under the umbrella of networking. This industry is nothing but networking. That's all it is. I have probably in all of the years I've been in in this industry, I've probably maybe been offered a job off my resume, maybe two or three times. Everything else has been, Hey, Tania, you're available. 
All right, boom, let me set you up with this. So it's really a network. We still have your resume, but it's really a networking thing. So you want to, when you're meeting people and you're out and about and you're meeting people in the industry, grab their card, get their information, follow up with an email once a month or, hey, just checking in, just want to say hi, whatever. That way you can be on their radar. So when opportunities come up, it's, hey, you're available. I'm looking for a PA. Can you jump on this project next week? Sure. When you get on the project, that's another opportunity to expand your networking web. So that's also really important. And then again, just ask questions because sometimes you can think, oh, this person is the, the EP or this person is, is the director of the show. He doesn't have time to talk to me. You'd be very surprised how many of those people in those positions will sit down and talk with you for 20 or 30 minutes just so you can pick their brain. And hey, and what's the worst can happen? They, they say, hey, I don't have time right now. Okay, go to the next person. And that's it. So that will, I think your experience, you have to, you have to groom your own and make your own experience. Like even as a PA, don't just sit and, you know, uh, you know, print this off and go get coffee. Yeah, still get that stuff because you got to pay your dues, but it's your, you're not an intern to go get coffee. That's just a way in. That's it. So go get the coffee from Starbucks. But when you bring it back, okay, who can I talk to? You know, who can I talk to? Who can I find information out? Because you have to make your own internship. Great advice, but uh, I would say this also, in, in your case, you're talking about wonderful ability and mm -hmm. great confidence and yeah. great self-confidence. And, and we are so happy and proud for you to uh, uh, have this opportunity to talk with you today. Of course, WIU is home, always will be. Yeah, and hopefully we'll see you again sometime in Macomb. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Well, thanks again for being on the podcast and thanks to our weekly viewers out there. If you are interested in being a guest on the podcast or you have somebody that you would like to recommend, you can just send me an email. We like to hear from our alums and we hope you continue to watch and listen to the podcast and appreciate everyone's support. So until next week, stay safe, take care and God bless.